Hello, NCIA members and supporters, and welcome to another edition of NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinar Series. NCIA's Industry Essentials are our new weekly educational series featuring a variety of programs, allowing us to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when you need it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, and I serve as the events manager here at NCIA, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity of introducing yet another fantastic educational opportunity for you all this afternoon. We will be conducting a moderated Q&A session at the conclusion of the presentation. So if you have any questions for the panelists, please don't hesitate to pose them by either using the Q&A feature available on the bottom toolbar or by sending them as a message inside the chat room to all panelists or everyone in the meeting. And our team will compile them for discussion. I've had the pleasure of seeing uh, these two panelists present at our previous conferences and Eric specifically countless times over the past few years. So I know you're all in store for a very informative and thought provoking conversation surrounding the current state of remote work, what to expect in the future, and how to improve your organization's security posture moving from reactive to proactive protection. And with that, I'll stop my screen share, turn it over to Eric for you all to uh, present today's session entitled Cannabis Summit Speaker Series, Hacker Proof Your Remote Operations, being moderated by Eric Schlissel, CEO and CTO at Geek Tech. Take it away, Eric. Thank you, Brian. I'm much appreciated and welcome everybody. It's great to see a lot of familiar names on the guest list. Um, it's been quite some time since we've been in person with you. Uh, but you know what, we'll take what we can get and it's good to see you virtually. Um, everybody can see my screen now, I hope. And um, what I'd like to do is just take a step back and talk a little bit about where we are, introduce ourselves and then get right into it. Um, we, as Brian said, would love this to be more of an interactive session than potentially many of the other webinars that you've been to. And we will be answering um, uh, questions on the fly throughout the presentation to keep it relevant. Uh, we're used to, um, <laughs> I'm used to, to, to presenting to a, uh, a Canvas audience. Uh, however, we also um, do a lot of presentations to a more technical audience. So if you see us going too deep technically, raise your hand. Tell us to be quiet. <laughs> we'll switch over. Um, we really want you guys to walk away with some tools you can use, uh, a lot of education, and a, um, a sense of uh, a direction of where you can take your next steps. So with that, we're going to take a quick step back. We're now at this point in this um, remote work life that we've all uh, migrated to, where we can take a deep breath and reevaluate what it is that we're doing. Uh, we need to buckle down for the long term, uh, apparently, in most states anyway, and take a step back and realizing that we've made a lot of choices in the moment that may come back to bite us um, is, is a very important thing to do right now. So looking at our offices, you know, we've likely, uh, you've gone through the process of figuring out what your security stance is, both in terms of physical security and uh, data security. Um, however, we are now in this hybrid model where we're relying on home networks, we're relying on our home PCs, we're relying on our either roommates, children, spouses, significant others. Um, we're relying on them having safe practices in addition to ourselves having safe practices online. So we're gonna take a look at what we can do now in order to be a bit more secure and while I don't know that anybody will be 100% hacker proof ever, uh, at the very least, we can raise the um, number of barriers to entry so that will look for more attractive um, uh, uh, targets. We do not want to be targeted. And if we are, we want to make sure that they can't get in easily because frankly, everybody has too much to do. They have too much to do. They want to look for easier hosts than ours. So with that, um, as Brian mentioned, I'm the CEO and CTO of Key Tech. We've been, um, my mic is breaking up today. So we have been, um, well, bear with me one second. Okay, that should be a lot better. Um, we, uh, I've been uh, in the cannabis industry with my company for the last uh, nearly four years, and we've seen a lot of change and a lot of, um, a lot of evolution. Um, and what, where we are today is um, 
far different than when we started. And it's not only because of COVID, it's just because of our evolution as an industry. And so we're all professionalizing. We're all taking a step in the right direction towards um, national, hopefully, uh, legalization. And we're um, becoming real businesses in many cases where we haven't been before. Um, so I've seen a lot of this. I've helped a lot of companies through this transition of um, reactive to proactive from startup to um, you know, more established businesses. And uh, as, as Brian also said, I've spoken with a lot of you uh, at conferences before. So I'm coming at this from a perspective of practicality. You know, we, we love technology, we love security, we wanna make sure that we are completely aligned, but we also have to make sure business gets done. And so I like having that balance between both security and um, both security and usability, and it's often a struggle. So with that, I thought it would be a great idea to bring my friend Joey in, who is a cybersecurity specialist at Sophos, a company that we do a tremendous amount of work with. Uh, they're a leading cybersecurity um, and threat management platform where they're, the software kind of goes throughout systems to networks and beyond. And um, with that, Joey, uh, to take a moment and introduce yourself. You yeah. Eric, thanks for the quick introduction. As Eric stated, my name is Joey. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity for over a decade. Uh, I got all kinds of neat little acronyms that go behind my name, CISSP, you know, Certified Ethical Hacker. As a lot of my colleagues say, I could probably make a lot more money on the dark web, but I don't think my ethics would be able to let me sleep at night. And I think that's where Eric and I get along a lot. We have the same common bond. We know security is really important for maintaining your data on a business level, but also just on a personal level, just making sure you have the right controls in place. So if you are targeted, you really want them to go somewhere else. You know, you want to keep the doors locked, but you don't want to lock everybody out that's important. And that's, you know, the hybrid. We are, we're here to help you guys balance the security that's needed in this distributed workforce time um, but also maintain work and workflows to, you know, because if the business can't work, money's not made, and that's bad for everybody. Yeah, and we talk a lot about physical security in this industry, and what we tend to not think much about is how physical and data security are, are intertwined. It's all part of the same puzzle. And when we are looking at our physical security, we think about cameras, we think about um, you know, access control and so on. One of the things that keeps happening is that people set up systems that are secure locally, but then leave them wide open to the internet. So if you're accessing your cameras remotely, which I hope all of you are, you have to make sure that that connection is secure and everything that's touching that connection is secure. So it's kind of a, a, a waterfall where you have to make sure that every single piece of the puzzle uh, is, is secure. Uh, every part of the chain uh, can't easily be broken. So let's just dive right in. Um, let's talk about some of the ways that we can today um, look at our, look at our, um, oh, here's a little bit about me, a little bit about Joey. And let's talk about how we can protect our existing networks. What do we need to look at? And, and with that, Joey, please dive right in. Let's get into it. Yeah. And, you know, I like to take the approach when you're talking about security, start with the easy stuff first. Don't overdo it, overcomplicate it, overengineer it. You know, the, the first common one is if you have any default passwords on your router facing your ISP or anything that's web facing, first step, change that bad boy. Because you guys know that you can go online, you can Google, you know, Netgear router default password, and then boom, now that's available for good guys, bad guys, and, you know, anybody else. When you're also using the same account, uh, typically it's your business email account or something like that. Um, you wanna make sure that you're using different passwords, even though it's the same account. And that's really just the best practices across the board. Uh, and when you're looking at your home users and the devices they're using, make sure that they're putting on, they're applying the updates. A lot of the updates that come out for your operating systems are to patch security holes you know, known ways that bad guys are getting in. So as vendors, we're coming in and going, okay, thank you. We found something, here's an update to help you out. You know, appreciate our work on the back end and definitely keep those updates coming. Um, and then additionally on the wireless side, since you know, 
a, you know, 10 years ago, wireless was a secondary connectivity. Now it's the primary connection. Just make sure your home networks don't have any open wireless. Yeah, if you have a router that has broadcasting wireless, just make sure it has a password. You know, using WPA2 uh, is your best bet. You know, the open networks and WPS, those are easy ways in. And then the other one is just, it's called shadow IT. You just wanna make sure that people are not connecting to your network or even for your end customers or, or uh, your staff, make sure that people aren't contacting them and saying, hey, I'm from Geek Tech and you're not authenticating who Geek Tech is and all of a sudden they're getting information about your network. And just really, you have to be aware of your digital space as well as we already are aware of our, our physical space. You know, it's a different world, like Eric was stating before, it was securing physical access to your buildings and your cameras. Now your cameras are available, you know, on the internet, you can go ahead and review them from home or from a, a remote office. You have to make sure that that communication coming from home or from that secure office is protected. You know, now you're kind of, you know, I always use the analogy if you're in a, at a concert. You know, it's one thing to have a conversation one-to-one -one in a private room, now with this space, we're having a conversation at a concert where everybody can hear, everybody can listen. So let's just make sure we're securing that communication between your uh, home networks, making sure they're not easy targets, and then securing the communication to your business, if it's your cameras or if it's internal services, uh, even your phone systems. So there's a lot of things to handle and, and really kind of take concern about. But start with the easy stuff first. Make sure that the home networks don't aren't using default passwords. You know, make sure you have endpoint uh, protections on your on your laptops and your mobile devices or any devices that are connecting in. You know, work with work with the tools you have. Just make sure that they're uh, they're sharp. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to give everybody on this call a little bit of a, a homework assignment. I would love for you to walk through your own front door and take a walk through where you live. Walk through each room and look at what's connected to your network. I've forgotten things that I've plugged in to my network for years. I've plugged a, t a smart TV in. Do I use that functionality? Mm -mm. No, I have an Apple TV that I use, right? Walk through your, your living space and see what's on your network and how your network connects to the internet. There might be some slam dunk items that you can either pull off or log in to make sure it's updated. We'll get to patching in a little bit, but it's really important. And, and to Joey's point about um, Sophos and patching, just this Saturday, uh, we received the notification from Sophos that there was a security threat. Nothing was compromised, but there was a threat to their firewalls. So we've rolled out a patch that night and none of our clients got compromised. Staying aware is such an important part of the security um, framework that you have. Awareness and patching go such a long way. In addition, when you're looking at all of these objects on your network, think about your PCs or your roommates or spouses' PCs. What kind of protection do they have? At the end, we're going to send you guys a, an offer for free home protection. Just download it. Just do it. Don't even think about it. Download the home protection, install it. Set it, forget it, keep it going. All right. So moving on. Um, when we're talking about um, protecting our networks, I, I want to get into a little bit about multi-factor authentication. I want to get into a little more advanced um, protection that uh, everybody can simply enable. So let's talk about encryption. Let's talk about two-factor authentication at a pretty high level. And then there might be another homework assignment. So get your notebooks ready. <laughs> Seems like there's gonna be a lot of homework assignments here, Eric. <laughs> Some awareness assignment. <laughs> Gotta make it practical, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. To, to Eric's point, I mean, secure connections between your sites and your applications. A lot of applications are in the cloud now, so they're, you know, software as a service. Just making sure that the communication between that, even if you have to reach out to your software vendor and ask them what they're doing to control access, just so you have your own peace of mind and your awareness. Uh, and then ensuring that only the proper ports are open. It's like locking your front door, but leaving all your windows open. And you know, yeah, your front door's locked and that's great, but how easy is it to sneak through a window? And that's the same thing, you know, when you're, you're trying to protect, you know, 
the people that are in your house, the data that's in your business. You know, you want to make sure if you're locking the doors, you're also locking the windows and the garage. And even if you want to get crazy, put a net over the, the, the chimney if you want to. Um, and then with, with the, the multi-factor authentication, if it's available, I highly recommend it. I mean, I know, you know, I, like I said, I have a particular set of skills, Liam Neeson style, and uh, I can do a lot of neat things. And I know personally that a username and password is not necessarily strong enough to protect your, your identity or even your access. Multi-factor authentication allows a layer of, you know, something you know, your username and password, and something you have. So either an ID token or an authenticator app, which makes it 1000% more difficult for me to compromise, which is, you know, amazing for you guys. Uh, for me as the bad guy trying to be the guy coming in, very frustrating, and that's what you want. Um, and encrypting your data whenever possible, and you know, there's a there's a cute saying that they have over here at Sophos that says, you know, dance like nobody's watching, but encrypt like everybody is. And I love that <laughs> thing because when you're on the internet, coming back to the concert analogy is, you know, we're basically speaking in a crowded room. You know, if everybody's speaking the same language, anybody can hear. It. By encrypting it, you're basically, you know, turning it into pig Latin or another foreign encrypted language that uh, only you and your your person you're talking to understand. And that's critical. So you don't get the man in the middle of people listening and spying. And then the last kind of thing, the need to know, you know, when your users are accessing or even you're accessing things, you know, you have to get a level of, you only need access to what you need for your job function. And that really comes down to just best practices because we're taking care of the data leakage or somebody's account getting hacked. And you know, it's, it's inevitable. It's not a matter of when it's a matter or matter if it's a matter of when. And then once it happens, you want to make sure that your exposure is very minimal. Yeah. It's, you know, if I need to get into the house, I'm going to have a key to the front door. If I only need access to the, you know, backyard or the shop, I'm only going to have granted access to the back door or the shop. And that's, that's critical because then if I leave or something bad happens to me, the only exposure you have are to my specific areas. You're not resetting everything. You're just resetting what I had access to, which makes your job a lot simpler. And it also makes it a lot easier to manage everything and not get overwhelmed with what could or what should be done. So, so that's, you brought up a ton of really great points. Um, and, and also a homework assignment. Um, the, you know, the, the idea that you're only as strong as your weakest password is incredibly relevant right now. So what I would love for everybody to do here is um, go to LastPass and download it. L-A-S-T-P-A-S-S, LastPass. LastPass is a, a nominal fee. I think it's like $10 a year, something ridiculous like that. If, if there isn't a free version, download that, install it on your browser and let it do a password audit. It can do a password audit. What? Joey's shaking his head. No, no, no. That, that, might, open, that might open Pandora's box there. And they're going to be like, I'm going to have the same password for 12 different accounts. Right. And 15 of them I'm not even using anymore. This could, this could open Pandora's box. <laughs> Fine. As long as we close it back up. Right. Okay. Like we can open it up, solve the problem and, and close it back up. The, the idea though is that you might not even recognize or know that you have the same password for a dozen sites. And we wanna solve that. And a password helper like LastPass will do that. It'll generate a secure password for you. I don't know most of my passwords. I would say that I know two or three. I, I shouldn't know my passwords, nobody should. My software should know it and then my software should be protected by a second factor. And this is a very, as, as Joey said, this is a very slippery slope that you can go down and start wearing tinfoil hats eventually and, and you know, go crazy with it. But it's one of those things that you can take a moment and since you have some time, um, you, can, you can go through it. Um, you'd also want to log into whatever sites you most frequently use and see if there's a two-factor authentication option. You can log in 
Facebook has one. It might be mandatory, I'm not even sure, but most of your social sites have two-factor options. You can download something uh, called uh, Authy, A-U-T-H-Y, which will generate secure passwords for you and even back them up to the cloud. So, you know, your, your browser does have built-in password management capabilities, but I don't think it's as robust as some of the third-party software is yet. Google will get better as it always does. Microsoft will get better as it usually does. Um, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that they're specialists, that this is their entire focus, and you want to use that kind of software. For instance, here's a great example of that. Microsoft does have antivirus software that comes with Windows. Microsoft Windows Defender, whatever they're calling it these days. It's fine. Honestly, it's fine software. They have some great security researchers. They do a decent job. But when I look at who I want managing my security, I want a company that that's all they do. I want all of it. I want them to be able to have an in-house team that is dedicated to this. They're publishing research papers. They're going through the process every single day of diagnosing um, uh, security threats, as opposed to a more um, generalized organization where their threat management system needs to talk to their development of whatever .NET platform updates that they have. And it gets really complicated and spread out as opposed to being singularly focused on keeping it protected. So the right tool for the right job. While you can have a generalist for some things, it's better to have a specialist in most cases. You wouldn't want your uh, general practitioner doing heart surgery. You just don't. So, um, that's a little bit of homework for you guys. Download a password uh, protection software. There's LastPass, there's KeePass, there's Last uh, FirstPass. There's just a whole bunch of them. But I like LastPass. It's what I use. It's what we use internally at our organization to share passwords within our organization. And then kind of to piggyback on what Eric said about the, you know, Google Chrome and the password managers there, just be aware that when you use a separate, uh, you know, application or plugin, especially with LastPass, it's actually storing your data encrypted. Um, when you have it in your browser, since your browser is tagging into a lot of different websites um, and there's a lot of hooks in it, it's just, it's bringing in exposure that's unneeded. That's why the LastPass and a password manager and your specialized tool is something that comes recommended, not just from Geek Tech, but also us here at SoFooks. Absolutely. Let's talk about endpoints. So an endpoint is a complicated device that connects to your network, like your PC, your Mac, your phone, which is a smart device, your iPad or tablet, whatever it is. Um, the, the, it's the devices that have more complexity to them and a full-blown operating system that you can interact with as opposed to a closed system, right? So an endpoint, I guess you could consider an Apple TV an endpoint. Go turn on your auto update on that and you should be fine. Um, but let's talk about endpoint protection, Joey. Why don't you uh, take the ball and run with it? Whew. So I might get a little nerdy here. So if you guys need to raise your hands and stop me, I have, I'll apologize in advance. Endpoints are your weakest link. I mean, let's, let's just be honest here. Everybody has a laptop. Everybody wants to connect it to everything. But the problem is that everybody wants it to be super convenient. And when you talk about convenience, that means they want everything to work all the time. And with that, they're accessing websites or downloading, installing applications that they're not even sure of the true source. You know, making sure and requiring that you have an advanced threat protection solution on it. Uh, we, you know, here at Sophos, we have a advanced threat protection. We have CryptoGuard, which is ransomware protection. It's not just antivirus, it's threat protection. Antivirus is a signature-based attack, which is, you know, your 1998 style attacks, your early 2000 attacks. Now your threats are very intelligent. They actually scan your systems, shut off services, and then they attack. It's impressive as a bad guy and a, as a developer, um, but with, you know, with your guys' best interest in place, an AV product is not enough anymore. Uh, and then malicious traffic detection. You know, where are these, where are these sites going to? There's a lot of sites that are named normal. Uh, or have a standard name. I mean, SanibelTours.com looks like a travel site. Uh, and then in the end, it's actually a malicious site. It's redirecting traffic and collecting data from you that you shouldn't be sending to uh, 
<laughs> to anybody outside of your organization. Uh, you know, and, there, and a lot of this stuff is transparent to users and without advanced threat protection and malicious, malicious traffic detection, now it's unknown to you. You know, and you can't protect against the things you don't know exist. So put the tools in place to stop it before it has a chance to, you know, infiltrate. Um, and then always scan your laptops on a scheduled cycle. Even with every protection out there, it's just doing an audit. You know, I lock my house, I have, you know, windows locked, but I still check the doors every night to make sure it's open. I still want to go and check my side gate to make sure it's not left cracked open, you know. And in the end, it's just you doing your due diligence to look a little deeper. And with most of your products, you can schedule this to happen automatically. So every night at six o'clock, it'll, it'll start a, a scheduled virus scan and deep scan of your system. And then back to the point we were making earlier, patch, update, keep all your applications to their most current version. Uh, the security updates for your operating system are the most easily exploitable session hijacking things you can do for a laptop or even a desktop. Um, this also goes for your cameras. If they're your camera application that you're using to, you know, review your security cameras at your site, make sure that that's updated. Um, you know, I've, I did proof of concepts where I leveraged a, uh, an NVR system to actually turn into my server and had access to the full internal network. So keeping that stuff in, you know, proper health, and being aware of your digital space is critical. Uh, and it just, it's, there's gonna be a reoccurring theme that Eric and I are gonna keep speaking on and that's just awareness and understanding. You know, If the data is leaving your house, if it's leaving anywhere, encrypt, you know, pretend and always assume that somebody is watching, that somebody's trying to get your data. You know, if you look at it and you think about it, your biggest adversary is ignorance. Really good points. So uh, a few items on this topic. The first is in your web browser, always look for the lock. Just look for the lock. It, it is at the top left next to the URL, next to the address that you're at, look for the lock. If the lock isn't there, run away. Just leave. It, it doesn't matter if it's some local um, you know, gardener that you're trying to hire and they don't have an encrypted site, that's just leave. It, um, it don't fill out a form. You don't know what that's going, where that's going to go. You don't know what is on the other end of that. Um, when you're doing your walkthrough of your house, think about your endpoints and think about their patching. A patch is an update from the manufacturer or software vendor that protects you from security. And sometimes it adds feature, uh, features, but it often is a security update where they've discovered a vulnerability. Software is incredibly complicated. And there are so many different ways to get past the built-in security. And what you have to also understand is that programmers are not particularly security focused. They're simply not. Even though coding practices have gotten better, they're more focused on getting the job done right and often on time because they're on a deadline. They have to ship product. They're not concerned about the extra five lines of code that will authenticate again if, they're, if you're in a critical part of their software, for instance, or you're putting in data. Okay, here's a great example of that. The Equifax breach, this is kind of ancient history at this point, it was over a year ago, but their data was sitting in their database unencrypted. Your social security number was just sitting there because they're lazy. Nobody checked, right? So you can't depend on other people doing the right thing. You have to do some of this yourself. And when you're walking through and looking at your endpoints, another thing to think about is backup. How are you backing up your data? As Joey was saying, we all will be compromised at some point. Everybody gets compromised. You have to go with that assumption, even if it's not entirely true. You got to go with the assumption that people are out to get you. And you have to think about what you would do if your laptop gets erased or your security footage at your dispensary gets erased. What's your strategy? How do you get out of that? How do you recover? Where is your data? Where's the second point where your data lives? And the third thing to think about with your endpoints is how are they protected beyond just what's built in, right? That's the third party software we're talking about, either Sophos or any other vendor. Look, respectfully to, to Joey and Sophos, we love Sophos. <laughs> there are a lot of other products that are also really good. So don't, don't think that we're just shilling for a particular solution. It's more about finding the right protection that's right for you. If your organization is using 
any number of different security products out there. They're generally pretty good these days. I would not trust any that were not written um, by countries that we have trust relationships with. That's probably good, not a good. That, that, that is a very good point because where is your data going? Where is it where being? Is data? Data? Eric, we have a question in the yes. Q&A. It says, uh, do you recommend hiring a cybersecurity person to be on site or use an online service uh, for a dispensary? Um, with that, you know, you and you can piggyback off of this, Eric, but when you're looking at a cybersecurity person, there's a lot of great services out there. Um, you want to do audits, of course. You want to have you want to have somebody take a look and get another set of eyes on your protections and recommendations. And it goes back to what Eric was stating earlier about having a specialized service vendor. The uh, the uh, connection earlier was the password manager, you know, and it goes, you know, IT guys are, everybody has their specialized sections, developers, programmers, IT, cybersecurity. We know a lot about a, uh, a little bit about everything, but we do have our areas of expertise and bringing an expert in to at least audit once a year, if not twice a year, is something that I highly recommend uh, just to protect from gaps and then have, now like your virus scans, have reoccurring scans on your network to make sure that it's not exposed. If changes are made, you should know about it, right? Tying it directly into dispensaries and the cannabis industry, I, we've been talking a lot general. We, you know, we've been going kind of all over the place in terms of um, who this applies to, but specific to the industry, um, there's a, um, you know, smaller dispensaries, a single dispensary or a single location, you have a much different budget than a multi-state operator, right? And so we want to keep this practical. You also have different needs. So if you're, for instance, a dispensary in, um, California that is dealing with medical and you have medical records or patient data, you're liable for the breach. You're liable for $1,500 per record if your data is breached. That's significant. I don't believe they've ever done an enforcement of that yet, but we don't know how that's going to go. Um, so dispensaries have a particular set of um, uh, challenges, right? On the one hand, you have a small staff. Right? You have a store manager who's likely responsible for your security. You have a security guy. You have, you have a very small staff. You have a very um, large amount of liabilities. And you have a significant amount of product and or cash at your location at any particular time. So your money is best spent by protecting that and putting a little aside for a security audit and a security plan. Right? Just to have a plan formulated and to execute on that not a significant undertaking. It's actually quite easy. And don't let the dollar signs daunt you. And also don't let local one man shops dictate your security plans, right? A one man operation in terms of IT consultants, you got to think about who you're working with, right? So if you're working with a very small IT operator, they typically don't have the resources to keep an eye on things even, and then react accordingly in the right amount of time. You want to work with some of the larger organizations mid-market. Um, you also want to work with software providers that provide some of the services for you. If you don't have the budget for a cybersecurity firm to help you, then rely on the vendor. Rely on the vendor's expertise and keep an eye on it yourself. Educate. And you can probably do it yourself as a single dispensary. Um, but once you get bigger, it becomes a much bigger picture. Um, you don't need somebody on site. At the end of the day, very few companies do. The larger companies do, but but in terms of in our industry, not really. Uh, and in most cases, you don't even need an IT person on site. Most of this can be done remotely with somebody with some knowledge on site. It's often the case that people overspend on things that they shouldn't. And um, this is not one of those areas that you need to dive too deeply into once you have your strategy um, once you have your strategy set. Um, and a follow-up question is, can we share vendors? Yeah, you know, what we can pro do at the end of this is send an email with the resources that we've listed um, in 
uh, in this conversation. We can send you links to the websites. We can send you um, our contact information. If you have any follow-up questions, we're both very open and available. Um, and to answer John Brooks's question, we operate across the entire United States, including Illinois. Um, we're national in both the United States and Canada. So let's move on to the next slide. Education. <laughs> oh, this is a tough one. <laughs> it's just tough. Go ahead, Joe. Let, let's, let's start it the same way we start everything else. You know, you could put all the controls in place. You can lock every door. You can lock your car keys. You know, you, you can do everything that you put in place. But sometimes your weakest link exists between the keyboard and the chair. You know, us as humans, we're, car we're curious. We want, oh, what's this? I want to click on it. Let's, let's see what's going on. Let me, you know, it's just, we're curious characters. And, you know, when, when it comes down to it, you know, you have to educate your people, you know, your team that is on your staff or your partners or even your vendors, you know, you need to have a well-educated team, you know, educate them about their digital surroundings so they can, you know, when I go to this site, what should I see? I should see a lock in the top left that it's an encrypted connection. This is the URL I should be going to. If I get an email that doesn't have a lock or, or a page that doesn't have a lock or it's the wrong URL, you know, how do I spot that? How do I take actions? You know, and to know your, your system behaviors. You know, we drive cars, we drive, you know, motor vehicles every day. And we know if we get in that car and we start it and we're you know, going down the road and all of a sudden it starts shimmering and shaking, something's not right. You need to have the same diligence on your, your digital devices. So your phone, your laptop, things like that. If you get on your laptop and it's running ridiculously slow, it just seems like it is just dog snail space. You really want to make sure that everything is running okay. And you should be able to spot these behaviors. And you know, encrypting the connections, looking for those neat little green locks at the top left of your browsers, and you know, knowing how to spot the bad guy emails. You know, if you don't have an Amazon Prime account, you should not get an email that says you need to reset your Amazon Prime email address. Yeah, I mean, things like that. Knowing how to flag the right email as bad and interact with the good emails, and obviously on on a on a level of knowing where the emails and where the stuff is coming from, being able to tag an email for external. So you can take an extra second or two to look at it and know that it, you know, came from somewhere else. Let me be extra diligent on my awareness. That's so we've gone in a state from a state of hearing from Nigerian scammers, right? That was very big for a little while. And then we went into the state where we were getting all of these fake FedEx package deliveries. Right, that, that went on for a year or two. And now we're in a really scary state where we're getting emails from people that might be in our finance department saying, send me my AR list. Send me a payment to this other firm from your CEO. That's frightening because it looks real and people fall, fall for it all the time. It, people who are smart, people that are educated and understand what they should be looking at fall for it because it looks real. It's insidious. And so external tagging is something that I want to get into a little bit more because it's something you could do yourself. No matter who your email host is, is Microsoft or, or uh, Google or whoever, there's an administrative area that you can go into and put in that any emails coming from outside your own domain, for instance, ncia.org, you, any, email coming out of that has a little uh, tag in the header, in the subject that gets added on that says external. So you know it's not from somebody inside your company. Do that. That's your homework for the slide. If, if nothing else, that's one of the things you need to take away from this. It, it is so critical to know where email is coming from. If you're glancing at an email and you see your CEO's name in it, you're going to think it's okay. It just, it's human nature to trust unfortunately, and, and that's what hackers take advantage of. So if you can go in and change those settings, just we'll send a link to how to do it in both Microsoft's uh, Office 365 and in Google. Please do it. Just please do it and then pay attention as you go forward. 
Um, I do want to get some more questions and we, we're actually, uh, we're, we're good on time. I just want to keep moving. Um, getting into free resources, we are um, going to send that email with a whole bunch of links in it. There are two links from our organization that we're going to share, two free resources. There are, um, we're doing, this is not related to security necessarily, but it is related to your bottom line. We're doing free audits of everybody's internet and phone bills. If you give us your bill, we will send it to our wholesalers and we will get you guys better quotes and you could potentially save money. Okay, that's unrelated to security. The other thing is that we're going to give um, two hours of consulting, uh, one hour each to two uh, participants in today's um, call. So expect that and expect a uh, sign-up sheet of where you can sign up for you know, the, the chance to win. And we're going to be giving two of those away. Uh, we're going to send links to Sophos's free products for endpoint protection of both your phone and your workstation. Um, and, and what you should really understand is that there are a lot of free resources for education. We could send a few of those. Uh, how, do you, how do you tell people what a phishing attempt is? How do you educate your people on when they get a phone call? Here's a great example, social engineering. We didn't even get into that. But people, <laughs> the, people can call up and say, hey, I'm with tech support. What's your password? How do you know that they're really with tech support? We're very trusting people. And so there, there are some educational resources that we can share for that. And what I also want to drive home again is to just update your systems. Update. It's such a simple thing. Turn on auto updates. Don't even think about it. Just do it. Let's go ahead and do it now. If you drop off, it's okay. <laughs> okay. And with that, um, I think that we, we're, we've covered uh, quite a bit of ground today, and I'm sure that there will be follow-up questions. We'll also include our contact information. Um, but if there are any questions now that haven't been typed in, please, please ask. We are here for this. Ah, cyber theft. Yes. Who do we report it to? Thank you for asking, Sandy. Um, if you are... Um, if you have a cyber theft incident, there are two things you should do. The first is, well, there are three things you should do. First, shut everything down, turn it off, and then turn things back on after you've had an opportunity to do an audit of how it happened. Shut it down. And I know it's gonna impact your business. I know that it's gonna be challenging, but you don't want it to get worse. It's just that simple. Uh, <laughs> socially isolate, if you will. Um, the <laughs> the, the next thing you want to do is contact the FBI and the local police, right? They, they don't typically do massive investigations, but you need that record because the third people you want to get in touch with is your insurance company. If you do not have a cyber insurance policy, go get one. We can also include a link to some people that we love for cybersecurity. They write policies that are specific for this. Uh, we'll include a link for that um, so that you can, um, you can communicate with them. So you also want to make sure that it's real. So one thing that we've seen lately is emails that are going out to people saying, we are in your system now, give us money. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> They're not. You can ignore those. Eric, there's another one that's going around just so everybody's aware where you will get an email with a password that has been compromised from maybe Equifax or something like that. So you could potentially get an email that has a password that was from another breach and in the email itself, it'll give you the password. Hey, we have your password and it might be one that you're using somewhere else, but it was part of another attack that could be five years old. It could be, you know, six months old. <laughs> so there's some really good attacks out there and that's where password management and awareness comes in. You know, knowing that, wait, I don't even use that email address anymore, but oops, I recycled the password. Oh, well, let's fix it. Let's not panic. Let's just fix it. And if you had a legitimate password manager, password helper, you can figure out which sites are using that password. And in some cases, you can click a button and it'll automatically change it for you to something more secure. Um, okay, Moncherie, thanks for another question. Uh, given COVID-19, how can newcomers, uh, what are some digital storefront recommendations. So are you talking about in terms of the actual, um, how you're doing a digital storefront, uh, like a, like your point of sale system that, that does online ordering? 
I, I'm not entirely sure what the um, uh, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what the question is, but what I would say is that there's every one of your software vendors that you do business with, you should have an understanding of how they approach security. They will be happy to answer your question. So if you're using Kova, you can call them up and you can say, hey, hey guys, we're concerned about people having access to our system that should not. Talk me through it. And they'll talk about how they have data at rest, right? Where, where's the data in their database? How are they storing it? What about credit card data? Do we have to worry about PCI compliance in places where we can accept credit cards? Or if we're using one of those sketchy services that allows us to, even though we're not supposed to? How do we make sure that we're not, we're not compromising our patients and our, our customers' data? Um, there's a lot to be said for just asking questions. Even if you don't understand the answer, ask follow-ups, just keep asking, 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 even when you think you hit a dead end. Um, what you end up with are people like Joey and me who just love talking. <laughs> they, we love talking security, we love talking about this stuff, and we love our, um, we love our, um, our, our practice areas. And so we'll talk about it forever if you want. And, and Munchery just asked a um, follow-up, online ordering systems, all right, so how do we make sure that they're secure? Good question. So you want to know uh, how your vendor, because you're not running it yourself, ho uh, hopefully, please don't, please, please, please don't. Um, you want to know how your security or your software vendor um, is managing their cybersecurity. Now you talk about not having somebody on site, they should. <laughs> they certainly should. You can ask them who their chief security officer is. And if they don't have one, Ask why not? Why are you not taking our security seriously? Your business is in their hands. And the more you ask them about how they're approaching this, the hopefully better answers you get and you feel more comfortable with them. I can tell you that there are a lot of really great software vendors in this space. I can also tell you there are a lot of really bad ones. And I'm not gonna name names because that's not how we roll. But I would say that when you start asking questions, you can figure it out pretty quickly. You can figure out who's serious about this and who is not. Some of them might have white papers that you can look at. Even if you don't understand what's in the white paper, the fact that they took the time to write it about security is important. It's important that they understand how, um, how they need to be focused on your security. Look, they, the bottom line is that if they get breached, they're out of business too. So they have a vested interest in making sure they're secure. I just don't know how well they're doing it. And even if you just do a little investigation, you could probably get a better sense of that. I hope that answers your question. And um, just to kind of piggyback on that real quick, Eric, there's a, the one underlining thing you should have every vendor do. If they're trying to hide their security secrets, that means they have no security secrets. They should be very open and transparent with you. If you ask a question and they go, I don't know, that's the wrong answer. It should be, I'll find out, or we already do this. And that just comes back to, you know, if they get breached, they're out of business. You know, it's not just your data, it's probably multiple companies and clients' data. You know, if they're secretive about their, uh, if they're secretive about their security controls, they're not the NSA. They should be open and transparent on what they're doing. That's part of the agreement you sign when you leverage their services, is transparency and security. And, and that's, that's the funny thing about security. The more open and transparent you are, the more secure you typically are. I mean, a lot of people trust open source software more than they trust Microsoft because you can audit the code. You can see it. That's a whole different conversation though. Uh, happy to talk about that too. Is, are there any other questions uh, from, from you guys? We can definitely stay on for a few extra minutes uh, help in any way we possibly can. Looks like we have one more in the oh. Q&A. It says, in Illinois, you're required to have 24-hour security that can be accessed remotely by state agencies. Do you have any recommendations? And do you recommend changing passwords every 30 days? Right. You want to feel so, that that? <laughs> I, I, could, I could feel this one. Uh, I'll feel the first part. You can do the same. Um, so so um, we really, we partner with a couple of firms that we love on the physical security side. And our firm actually has gotten into physical security because our clients wanted an integrated solution and one company to handle it. I would say that we do it, um, I don't, I, actually I can't say how much percent, 
how many percent uh, of our clients we do it for, but it's significant. We do a lot of this. In terms of vendors for physical security, we really like March networks a lot. They're actually members of the NCIA. Uh, you might have heard them speak before. They're great. I actually considered having them on this call, but we're really talking about digital security and not physical. Um, their systems are secure, I can assure you that they are accurate and instead of correctly. The other thing that to keep in mind is that when you're installing a security system, there's going to go over some of your heads, but there's, uh, there's something called a VLAN, a virtual uh, local area network. So when you have a, 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 an NVR, you have a, a video recorder, it sits on a network, right? It goes over a network to get, data from the cameras and so on and so forth. You want that network to either be physically or logically separated from the rest of your data because that is one of the weakest links of your network because it's outside, it's accessible from the outside. And so even if it does get breached, you want it to not have an impact on the rest of your operations. Okay, so, so that in itself you, you, is a very important thing. And if you have separate security companies from IT companies, they need to work together. They need to partner up. And in cases where we're not doing security, we're just doing IT and, and uh, data security for our clients, we partner with the security guys to make sure their stuff is set up correctly. It's a very weak link when you have security guys that do not understand networking, setting up your security. It's great for, for security, right? It's great for, for getting the right angles, the right footage, the right retention and all of that stuff, but it's not good for when it lives on your network and it's not set up to be separated. It has to be. So we like them. We're um, Genetech I see is on the call. They're a great provider. They have great equipment. Um, we've also worked with access for cameras. Gallagher systems is a little bit intense for this crowd. Um, but I'm happy to talk about if you have anything that's on your plate right now and you're considering a few different vendors, hit me up. I'm happy to spend some time talking to you about the different options you have in front of you. Um, there are some great vendors out there. There are some really bad ones. I would advise against going with anything you can buy off the shelf at Costco or anything like that. Anything that's manufactured overseas. I know that sounds pretty harsh, but it's pretty, it, it's, it's a security issue. You don't know who's coding that. It's not what we recommend. Hanwha, uh, Hanwha, uh, whatever that other company name is, don't go there. Just don't do it, even though it's cheaper. Hikvision, that's thank you. Thank you, Haley. Um, <laughs> don't go with them. They're not secure, they're cheap, but you get what you pay for. In terms of password security and changing your passwords every 30 days, no. No. 30 days is both too frequent and not really that secure. So if you're changing it every 30 days, you're likely going to be reusing the same password every once in a while. And here's what's even better, okay? Better than changing your password is making your password impossibly long. Make it a sentence instead of an eight character password. Right, so, so the way that passwords get cracked, there are a few different ways of doing it, but one way of doing it is simply called a dictionary attack. Right, where they run a dictionary against passwords through numbers here, they threw capitals and so on. You know, machines move impossibly fast. It's incredible how many passwords they can cycle through a minute. Um, potentially millions and millions an hour. Right? So your eight character password is, think about it this way, every single character you add on makes it exponentially harder to crack. So if you have a password that says, I like vanilla ice cream, that is far more secure than, you know, pet name 42 or, you know, your birthday followed by any word, any word in the English language, because it has to crack. Think about it. If, if it's, I like vanilla ice cream, they have to go through each one of the permutations leading up to that, even without a number. It's more secure than one with one that's shorter. So password uh, cycling is actually, um, you know, it's funny, the person that came up with password complexity rules back in the day in the 70s or, or early 80s actually recently came out and wrote its whole blog post about how a longer password is more secure than a shorter one that's more complicated. So for corporate systems, we sometimes put in a policy for 90 or 120 days. But that's mostly because insurance companies aren't with the program and require it. Now, Joey, you probably have more to say about that than I do, though. 
yeah, honestly, you're right on. You're right on the, the right road. I mean, that's what it is. It's it's about the strength of the password, not the frequency of the password. Um, I mean, and you can do the 30, 60, 90 day life cycle, but as Eric was stating, you're going to run into two primary problems. You're going to make it so it's a, a reused password just because of frequency. You're going to make it so it's an easier password or on the other side, it's so complex, they end up writing it on a piece of paper anyways, or keeping it in a note on their phone. Um, and they're not using a password manager. It's not, and it's just, you want to make sure that the plan and the policy is the best for your company. And that's where, you know, geek tech can come in and definitely give you some, you know, some advice on how you should handle that. You know, if you're using a password manager, that's fantastic. You can even use, uh, you know, business password managers like LastPass where you can share passwords throughout your company and give people access to certain passwords but you still manage the password itself or have the password manager create the password. There's a lot of different tools out there. You know, it's really, you know, what fits best for your company, your need, and what can you manage uh, the most effectively? Right. So this is nothing to do with security, but Jack Dorsey, the, the founder and CEO of Twitter said, the best camera is the one you have with you. And it's very, very similar when it comes to uh, this type of software. It's the one you use, right? And, and anything is better than nothing. Some things are better than, than anything, but you want to just get started somewhere and then you can continue down the path. You got to take these easy steps first and then keep going. So Sean McLean has a uh, question. How often should we check with our vendors regarding security or full soft testing? It depends on the vendor, right? Some vendors don't do that. You want to have an idea of when your, um, your hosting provider, for instance, does penetration testing. You want to have an idea of when you're, you know, getting back to Moncherie's question about your digital ordering system. Do they do pen testing? How often? What do they do with the results? Is it third party? Does somebody else do it? Tell me more about that. The, the more often they do it, obviously the better, but the fact that some people will say, oh, we haven't done that, that's when you run away. We don't want everybody to be cybersecurity paranoid. We want people to be aware. Awareness then gets into, you know, educated, right? So if you're asking the questions, it will obviously lead to more follow-up questions about SOC testing, about standards and practices, around how they're handling incidents, right? Incident management is incredibly important. Those are some of the questions you should be asking too. What happens if you get breached? Not only breached, but what happens if your, your hosting goes down? Where are you hosted? If you're with AWS, are you using multiple regions? Are you prepared for a disaster? What disaster preparation do you do? And what kind of testing do you do around that and when? Again, if your vendor is evasive, then they don't have good answers. If they say, well, we'll get back to you and then somebody higher up does, then you know you're on the right track. At least they're thinking about it. Um, and that's kind of good enough for a lot of people. Now, you, when you're engaging for the first time with a vendor, that's when you start asking questions. If you're already engaged, I would send an email out to all of them and potentially have a little spreadsheet where you're just tracking how they're doing. Has anything come out? Have they had a breach? Are they letting you know if there is an incident? Or what's their notification protocol? A lot of companies like burying these things. They don't believe in transparency. Joey, you have more to add, I'm sure. I, I'm, I'm back here just kind of like a little kid in a candy store right now. The, <laughs> the thing you need to consider with all your vendors is their incident response plan. What they're going to do if an incident happens. What's their notification structure? How do they reach out to you? If they don't have a plan in place, there's no way they're going to execute in the event of an incident. Um, regarding the SOC testing, uh, typically, that's an annual renewal. If they're SOC, you know, they're typically data storage. Uh, a lot of your data centers, you know, uh, they're, if they're housing your data and securing your data, um, they should have an audit report annually that shows that they've passed it and they're compliance. They'll actually go through a mid, uh, you know, a six-month audit, and then they have so much time to remediate any findings. But they should be able to submit an annual certification. Hey, look, we're SOC 2 again. Everything is still good. Don't worry about it. Um, but when you're really 
you know, having the discussion with your vendors, you know, Eric and I have really been, you know, kind of underlining this one key phrase, be aware. You have to know what your vendors are doing. You have to know what your end users are doing. And awareness is key. Know your digital surroundings. Know who's looking over your shoulder when you're putting your password in. Um, and know who's connecting to your systems. And if you have questions, find somebody who can help you clarify them. If it's talking to your vendor, if it's reaching out to somebody, you know, like Eric, you know, just have the right people on your team and be aware of your surroundings if they're physical or if they're digital. So, so, you know, w one of the things that I like thinking about is trusting nobody much, right? You have to trust some people. At some point you have to trust that they're doing the right thing, but trust and verify. I hate to, to quote uh, Reagan, but that's, that's, it's true. You have to both trust and uh, authenticate and make sure that they're doing the right thing. You also need to take some responsibility yourself. At the end of the day, it's your business. And your responsibility is to make sure that you're aware and then make sure that your vendors are appropriate for what you're doing and also taking your business into account. Relying on their self-interest is okay, but it doesn't really get the job done, right? Because most companies will just operate in terms of profit as opposed to what's right. And what's right is what you should focus on. What, what are they doing that's right by me? What are they doing right by our company? What are they considering when they're looking at their own platforms? And third parties can be very helpful for that. We do that type of thing all the time. And you should ask your provider, your IT provider, how they're handling their internal security. So what, one of the things that we're seeing, and, and we're gonna get into final thoughts um, momentarily, but one of the things that we're, we've seen is that vendors are getting attacked and then the IT vendors, and then they're attacking the entire client base. So I come from this from a perspective that if, if we get breached, everybody gets breached. All of our clients get breached. And if your provider isn't looking at it that way, then you really need to ask hard questions. And again, we're not, this isn't about promoting our own services. It's more about promoting your business and making sure that you're not putting yourself at risk. There are a lot of really great IT providers out there. Obviously, we'd love to work with everybody, but there are really good providers out there that are solid. I'm friends with a bunch of the owners of our, our competitors, and we all talk about this stuff. We all talk about our own security. We talk about how we're going to make sure that our weakest links, our techs, you know, some of my, some of my team are actually uh, uh, on this call right now. You guys are the weakest link. Are, are properly trained, Eric. Awareness training, you know. We try to take care of our own people. <laughs> <laughs> we do we do a lot of awareness training internally, but at the end of the day, it's it's really people are the weakest link. Always. Technology is weak, right? By inherently, like the internet. Okay, I, again, I'm going off on a tangent here, but the internet was written at a time when security wasn't even considered. So the protocols themselves are not very secure. And people were created long before data security was a problem. <laughs> so we're also a weak link in this chain. And we have to all be aware of our own um, responsibilities here. So if, if there's a final thought for me, it, it's that. It's awareness and taking responsibility for at the very least understanding what the risks are and taking some form of action to mitigate them. Whether it's in-house, it's a third party, or, or somewhere in between, um, you have to understand that this is critical to your business. It's an existential threat when you get breached, especially when it's ransomware and it takes out your internal system. There's all sorts of bad stuff that happens. Understanding what those bad things are and understanding where your vectors of attack are and then closing them up. It's the best thing you can do for yourself. And again, we're going to send a bunch of resources. I implore you to read them and ask any follow-up questions. We're here for that. Do you have any follow-up uh, final thoughts, Joey? I just want to go back to the statement we put earlier is just be aware of your surroundings. <clears throat> and if you have to, ask the tough questions to your vendor or your service providers, because if they don't know, they're not doing you the proper service. And just be aware, control, your own environment, but also make sure whatever choices you take are the best interest for your company. It's not just the tools, it's what's the most value for your company. 
And with that, thank you, Brian. Thank you, uh, NCIA. And thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate the attention you've given us. I see that a lot of people are still on. It means that you're getting some value or you just left the room. <laughs> but either way, thank you very much for taking the time to attend this and to educate yourself. And, and please do look for follow-up email and uh, take some action. Wow, thank you so much, Eric and Joey. Um, I, being someone who, who was originally planning on maybe going into network security after high school, um, I always find your sessions in particular super, super interesting and valuable um, just to hear how things have changed so dramatically in the last 10 years. Um, thank you all so much for that. Um, I know all the audience members were really, really appreciative as well. So why don't we, uh, why don't we do a virtual round of applause for all of the panelists by uh, posting a thank you message in the chat room and letting them know what you know, little bit of tidbit of information that you took away uh, from this presentation to be the most valuable. Um, as uh, the panelists have mentioned, um, you all will be getting uh, follow-up emails asking you all to complete some surveys regarding this session, as well as promoting those awesome opportunities that Eric is going to be offering to you all and some of the exclusive opportunities to a lucky winner. So do stay uh, on the uh, lookout to your inbox for those follow-up emails and resources. Um, and then do be aware that you will receive a PDF version of this presentation immediately upon conclusion of the webinar. So if you all uh, are interested in reviewing any of the materials presented or utilizing the contact information slides that you see here uh, in order to get in touch with Eric or Joey, um, just stay on the lookout to your inbox and that'll be sent your way immediately. Um, and then to conclude the session, we did want to leave you all with a few sort of uh, upcoming announcements about our upcoming events and housekeeping reminders uh, on how to best make your uh, use of NCIA's uh, membership. So, all right. With that, uh, in case you did miss it, um, we have decided to postpone our upcoming, um, sorry about that, upcoming seventh annual Cannabis Business Summit and Expo from June until late December. This decision wasn't made lightly. However, NCIA's primary goal throughout this crisis is protecting the health and safety of our community and the nation at large first. Head to CannabisBusinessSummit.com to sign up to receive all the exciting news we'll be releasing in the coming weeks, including a very special keynote speaker we can't wait to tell you about, and exciting de developments for any product brand hoping to make a big splash on the expo floor this year. This will surely be a can't miss event and one we'll all desperately need on the other end of this crisis. So as soon as you're able to commit to traveling to an in-person trade show later this year, sign up to ensure you are at the epicenter of the cannabis industry this fall. Additionally, we have also postponed our 10th annual cannabis industry lobby days, which was set to take uh, place in a few weeks until this fall. However, along with that postponement, we have also made a number of structural changes to the event, which will provide a more all-inclusive experience to the NCIA members volunteering their valuable time to our efforts. Admission, which is still just a nominal fee, will now cover the cost for all attendees to participate in our welcome reception, breakfast training, and our new closing celebration in support of the NCIA PAC. We'll also be hosting the second edition of our new VIP day, which provides even more access and opportunities to participate in historic moments on Capitol Hill with fellow cannabis industry leaders and our congressional champions. We're hoping to bring together all of those who participated in the past, as well as hundreds of newcomers this year to celebrate the 10th anniversary of our organization and all the historic progress we've made together this past decade. So mark your calendars today as the most impactful days for two cannabis industry advocacy will now be held from September 17th or September 15th, excuse me, to September 17th. And you can register today at the cannabisindustry.org slash 2020 lobby days. Have you or your business felt the pinch from a lack of exposure at in-person events these past few weeks? Well, you're not alone. And as always, NCIA is here to help. We're super excited to announce that we just released a wealth of digital marketing sponsorship packages across all of our highly trafficked platforms. And you can head to our website to learn more, then schedule a meeting with one of our biz dev team to discuss in more detail today. And finally, I am very pleased to announce the launch of our new members only Fireside Chats with NCIA Government Relations Team series taking place this Wednesday, April 29th, with a session entitled Staying Politically Engaged in the Age of Coronavirus, an update from Washington, D.C. 
These intimate discussions are an exclusive opportunity for NCIA members to hear from our government relations team and guests about the latest developments in federal policy. Wednesday's session will focus on providing NCIA members with ideas on how to effectively communicate while practicing uh, social distancing and guide you on how to navigate the political process during, these, during this difficult time. Finally, thank you all so much for participating in another edition of NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinars. Uh, this content wouldn't be possible without the hard work and dedication of our nearly 2,000 NCIA member businesses. So if you aren't a member already, please consider joining today. I hope to see you all later this week on Wednesday's members only fireside chat with NCIA's government relations team. And I thank uh, both Eric and Joey for presenting that fantastic panel once again for us today. Um, I hope to see you all soon. Stay on the lookout for those surveys and those follow-up resources and we'll see you all next time. <music>